Hello and welcome to this edition of Crossover. I'm Ji Xiaojun. Hello from Beijing. I'm Louisa Li. This is indeed a very special edition. We have some new couches here. We have some new red couch. <laughs> exactly. So comfortable. Oh, well, this is a special edition not because of the couch, not because of the color. This is really about the topic today. We're to going to talk about AI. Yes, robots. AI not necessarily, but AI yeah. robots is something that, that's in my mind when I think of AI. AI is everywhere now. Everyone is talking about AI, uh, the influence AI might have on, on us in the future. And we've got some books also about uh, the possible influence on AI. Thinking yeah. back, in 1984, when I was watching the movie wait, Terminator. Wait, 1984, yes. AI. Do you remember the movie Terminator? Yeah, Schwarzenegger? Yes, that was when the AI robots were attempting to destroy the humanity. That's AI? I, that's I AI, the robots were AI. But, but I thought that's aliens, right? <laughs> <laughs> From that's a another different planet. That's a, that's a different movie. Okay, yeah. but AI is not only happening now these days in movies, it's actually happening, happening right in now. our life, yes. in this world, not from a, a, a different you know, planet or whatever. It's or not a sci-fi movie, it's actually That's happening right, right it now. It is real, right here happening. Just look at the, um, the story about the IFAGO. It's scary, right? Yeah. I mean, it frightens people. A machine actually beats human beings mm -hmm. in a game that human beings thought were best at. Yes. <laughs> you know, human, and 10-something and years ago, it's, um, it's, it's chess competition. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a master being beaten yeah. by a machine if I remember it correctly, it's called Deep Blue. Mm. So, yeah. I don't know, it's now happening, and uh, there is all, everyone is talking about it. People are worried about the future possible threat it might have on human beings, especially on the job market. Yeah. We never know. I mean, there is even a, a summit, a conference actually being held in China, and in Hangzhou. And then you met some interesting people, Exactly, right? I went there, I know I did some interviews, one of them is the author of this book. This is an international bestseller. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the Brief History of, of Humankind. humankind sapiens. And this is The Brief History of Tomorrow. Yeah. And in this book, it did mention about the possible impact of AIs on the job market. In the future, he's not happy. Well, not happy. He's um, not optimistic, I yeah. should say. He's worried about it. He's yeah. extremely worried about the future. I'm worried too. Yeah. and. Your worries make me worry <laughs> <laughs> about my future. Now, uh, there is also one other professor I also had an in interview with. He's the professor from Cornell University, and he's also the Turing Award winner. And we had interviews with them, and we talked about uh, their thoughts about job markets in the future being influenced by AI technology. Let's take a listen. There is a general agreement among experts that it will be very different, but, um, and that many jobs will disappear, we don't know if enough new jobs will appear to replace all the lost jobs. And uh, even if some new jobs appear, we don't know what they are. And therefore, we, it's very difficult to prepare young people today to fulfill these future jobs because we don't know what they are. Can you also go to detail, say, what kind of jobs are more likely to, to be, be replaced exactly by yes. all these AI robots or computers? Jobs that involve mainly monotonous activities, it doesn't matter if it's physical or cognitive. As long as it's a repetitive, monotonous activity, uh, are the easiest to replace. So this involves not just, you know, uh, manual laborers in textile factories or truck drivers, but even something like a doctor. Uh, if many doctors, most of what they do is to diagnose disease and just recognize biological patterns in your body, and this is something which will be relatively easy to replace. If you're a doctor who is researching a new cure for cancer, and this demands a lot of creativity and flexibility, then that's a different matter. But many doctors who just diagnose disease, uh, this will probably be much, much easier and more efficiently done by an AI than by a human being. What exactly is going to happen with the jobs? I and mean, what kind of jobs are more likely 
to be replaced by, to be done by, by automation, say, in the future? There's, there's just an enormous number of jobs that are going to disappear. Uh -huh. And the jobs that are going to be left, I think some of them are going to be at the high end. Uh, who are the people who are going to automate these systems and write the systems that manage things? Uh -huh. But then there will be, I think, jobs at the low end where it's someone who's taking care of an older person. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the pay won't be as good, but it, it may be a very satisfying job. Mm -hmm. But the concern of the loss of jobs, well, we've seen concerns like that, mm -hmm. like you mentioned in the 19th century when we had the, we had the industrialization, industry revolution, people were worried about this. And then new technology brought new jobs, actually. Yeah. It's not the same jobs, but new jobs, new job opportunities. So mm -hmm. do you think it's the same concern being repeated again that new technology would actually not just drive but also some new opportunities? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, we don't know for sure what will happen, but it's dangerous to assume that what happened in the 19th century will repeat itself exactly in the 21st century because there are two main differences between the current revolution and the industrial revolution of the 19th century. Humans have two basic kinds of ability, physical and cognitive. Now, in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, machines competed with us in physical abilities, but not in cognitive abilities. So what we saw over the last century is that humans increasingly moving to working in jobs that require cognitive abilities. Now what is happening is that machines begin to compete in cognitive abilities as well. And we don't know of a third kind of ability that we can say, oh, okay, so they are better in physical uh, jobs and they are better in cognitive skills, so we will do that. We don't know what this third kind of skill might be. This is the, the first difference and, and, and problem. The other problem is that the pace of change is accelerating. And even if there are new jobs, it's unclear whether the people who lost their jobs will have the time to retrain themselves and gain the necessary skills for the new jobs. In the previous occasion, when you lost your job in the farm as, 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 as a farmer, you moved to the city and you could find a new job in the factory because these jobs were many of them were low skilled jobs. And within a few weeks or months, you could learn how to operate the machine and find a job. But in the future, when people think about what new jobs will appear, they usually say that the new jobs will involve a lot of creativity and originality and high skills, something which is not routine, because this is AI can do easily, things like designing virtual reality games. But the problem is that this is high skill. So if I'm a 40-year-old textile worker and I just lost my job to a robot, but there is a new job designing a virtual reality game, I don't have the skills. And it will take me many, many years, if at all, to acquire these skills. So we could have a situation in which there are many new jobs, but the people who lost their jobs just can't have the necessary skills to work in that. So what is more likely to happen in the future with the job market? Well, when you're talking about very high skill, very creative, very like flexible, non-routine kinds of jobs, this for the foreseeable future, it will be still difficult to replace that with AI. If we mention, for example, doctors, so to do routine tests and diagnose diseases, this is something that is just pattern recognition and AI will be able to do better. But then you have very creative and skillful doctors who research, say, cancer, and try to find a new medic medicine for that. And this kind of skill, it will be much harder, not impossible, but much harder for AI to do in, say, 50 or 100 years. So you will still have jobs for the like upper 10% of the medical community, but the 90% at the bottom who are doing more routine jobs, they will lose their jobs. Again, at, at the very bottom, you may uh, find people 
who, whose jobs are so um, cheap that maybe it's not economical to even try and replace them. So the, the greatest danger is about the middle section jobs that you pay high salaries today and so corporations will have an incentive to replace these expensive workers with AI, but they are doing routine job, so it's easy to replace them. Yeah, it's not just the ordinary doctor, it's something like, um, say, a trader in the stock exchange. They make a lot of money, these traders, but it's relatively easy going to be to replace them with AI. So this is the most, the greatest danger for the jobs are in the middle. When you get a high salary, so there is an incentive to, 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 to kick you off, but you're still doing a rather routine job, so it's easy to replace you. Well, it seems the two guests, they share at least one thing. Yeah. The high-end skill, low-end skill... Will stay. Will stay. But the middle part will be gone. That's a very scary thought. But the thing is, I mean, it's easy for them to say so, or for anyone to say so, but are we, are we in the... Um, which category are we? Are we in the middle? Or <laughs> I don't right? know. I don't know. I, I hope we're not in that middle range. I mean, hopefully you have more talent but than I mean, just... If, they, if that is something that... That's more likely or definitely going to happen in the future. So what do we do um, if I we think try we to save our jobs? I think we have to be more creative. That's something that the AI doesn't have, right? How do we prepare ourselves? I, I mean, basically, you don't... I mean, they say, well, some jobs will be replaced by AIs, but some will stay. But how do we know which jobs are going to stay? And they say, well, new jobs will be created, but yeah. what kind of new jobs? But, you know, nobody knows, and everyone is very concerned about this. Even, yeah. I was reading this article, even Stephen Hawking is concerned that this AI revolution will pose a threat to the job market. Yeah, so, so, so it seems there isn't much we can do. I mean, this is really about the education. Yeah. How do we prepare ourselves, if not ourselves? What about the younger generation? I mean, because what they are now learning probably won't be needed in the future. Yeah. So how do we actually prepare train them, yeah. prepare them for the future. That's hard to say. Yeah, let's hear yeah. what they have to say. So uh, this brings me to the educational issue. Mm. Partly I say if you get a good job, you better have a scientific or technical education. But you don't want to focus specifically too narrowly on that technical education. You want to take some history or humanities or something else so that you will understand if you're going to be in a leadership position you will understand uh, some of these other issues which are going to be very important. Mm. And it's, it's going to take well-educated people to figure out exactly what we should be doing. You probably want to learn how to learn <laughs> because okay. you're going to have to continue learning. Lifelong learning experience. Right. For our parents or grandparents, what, what they, well, they only went probably to high school or to elementary school. But what they learned sort of stayed stable during their lifetime. Mm. Mm. I mean, many things that were taught when I was in college, one of them was something called drafting. This was drawing pictures of, mechan of mechanical devices and so forth. That skill has disappeared as, as a skill today. There are, there are automated ways of doing that. Yeah. But the changes were relatively slow, so that you had maybe 10, 15 years to learn something new. Uh, but the changes now are going to be very fast. There is also uh, one, one argument, say, probably the focus is now not right if you are, we're preparing talents or workforce for the future. Because in China, we tend to have this tradition of focusing more, especially from the parents' uh, right. perspective, on college education. Right rather than, like in Germany, more on vocational education, preparing all these necessary skills, not necessarily diploma education, or, 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 or say, degree education. Right. Do you think we should shift our focus, too, to more vocational education? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the vocational education, because when, when I was young, there, there was vocational education for people who wanted to become drafters, uh, drawings. 
uh, or carpenters or, or certain things. Mm -hmm. And it would train people for sort of the lower level jobs. That, uh, that would be more likely replaced by right. machines in the right. future. <laughs> right. I tend to favor more uh, uh, a scientific education or, or an education uh, which is more in the humanities or the social sciences uh, and, and, and a broad education. Mm. Optimists say there is always one ability owned by human beings that is beyond non-conscious algorithms. Do you believe so? The one thing that we have, and AI is unlikely to have in the foreseeable future, is consciousness. Again, the ability to feel, the ability to feel fear or love or hate or pain or anything at all. But unfortunately, for most jobs in the economy, you don't really need that. Most jobs in the economy require a tiny part of the human ability. I mean, there are a million things that a taxi driver, a human taxi driver can do and a self-driving car cannot do, like appreciate a joke. But the economy doesn't need any of these things. It just needs a taxi to take you from point A to point B as quickly and as efficiently as possible. The economy is really underutilizing uh, this human potential. I don't think we can compete with the AI in the economy, in the job market, and I don't think we should. So um, you don't have to work, or we don't have to work sometimes in the future. Good news? I don't know. I think I would panic if I didn't have a job. But it's good news. You don't have to work. It, it, I mean, it would be good for the first, life, right? first few months, but after a while, then you're, you're you thinking, get bored. yeah, and then what are you going to do with the rest of your life? I mean, I mean, of course, you can enjoy your time with your family and your friends. Yeah, but, but all the time, they will complain. Yeah, <laughs> they will complain. <laughs> you spend too sure. much time at home now. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people find, you know, the feeling of success and yeah. confidence through their work. That's so what happens if we don't have a job? That's right. That's how you fulfill you, your social values, yeah. basically. That's, you know, why you are who you are. Yeah. Because you're doing this and that for, for the society, for your family, and more likely for yourself. But if you don't have to work, or you really, you don't have a job to do in the future, the sense of feeling useless or valueless, yeah. that's scary. And you feel like you're not contributing to the society. So, so, so what do we do? Yeah, what do we do? What will happen to the population who are made abundant by the AI technology in the future? What will happen to them? What do they do in the future? Doing, I don't know, computer games? Or how do they kill time? And more importantly, actually, if the majority of the population are being made abundant by technology, so how do we describe human values again? How do we understand the word humanity again? If we leave aside the question of how to support these people, let's say we have some scheme of universal basic income, so we use all the wealth generated by the computers and robots and distribute it in such a way that everybody has enough to eat and wear and, and so forth, so let, let's put aside this problem. Then the big problem becomes meaning and purpose and what do people do all day and what is the meaning of, of, of human life? Ideally, people could use the opportunity to really explore the, their mind, their consciousness, their potential, their ability, because we know very little about the human mind and about the human potential. For most of history, we've been so preoccupied with you know, growing rice and with manufacturing shirts that we had very little time to explore the full potential of, of, of humanity. And maybe finally, we will have the opportunity to do that. But of course, humans being humans, the danger is that many of them will just want to have pleasant and exciting experiences. And more and more people will spend their lives not just looking at smartphones like today, but immersed in virtual reality. Well, you want to find something that individual citizen can be engaged in and can feel that they have a life. You know, whether it's exploring the world by travel, uh, whether it's going to art museums, we've got to find things to engage the population.
And there is one more thing. There is always one more <laughs> thing. What about I mean, if we come back to what you mentioned in Terminators and all these aliens or robots? Robots, yeah. Do you think AI robots will they, be like that in the future? I don't know. I mean, they are also connected with people, with human beings, in the way that they think, they feel like human beings. They, they even have emotions. They, I don't know if they have tears or not. You know, when we're going online, we're doing online shopping, we're, at, we're talking to customer service, they're not real people anymore. But it seems they understand you. Yeah, when you're talking to these people yeah. or machines online. But you never know their machines are. Or not. Or I'm always confused. I'm always beings. thinking, I, w I wonder if it's a person talking to me or the machine talking to me. So that's scary. So I don't even know if they're, and I can't even tell apart. There is one latest development. Maybe it's with face Facebook, if I remember mm -hmm. it correctly. And they have that system. Yeah. It's about, you know, having a conversation. And then what they were doing was... Uh, they had two digital figures talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And later on, what's scary is they found out that actually the conversation between the two digital figures, people could understand, we, we right? Understand. They had their own language. Exactly. Whether it was malfunction or not, I don't know. People but basically, were human afraid. beings are yeah. not able to understand their conversation. It's written in English, it's all in, you can print it out, but somehow you didn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. And then what's the result? Then that could be dangerous. No, they uh. they terminated. <laughs> <laughs> terminated. Basically, they they turn mm. off the power. It's not connected with the rest of the network. Mm. It's that sounds scary. Yeah. And maybe because of the very reason they stopped that. Well, not stopped, but you know somehow, it's isolated. But do you think the robots in the future will have that will have that function to be able to understand human emotions? Let's hear what they have to say again. We shouldn't confuse intelligence with consciousness. AI, I mean, intelligence is the ability to solve problems. For example, knowing what is your medical condition and giving you a cure. Consciousness is the ability to feel things like fear. To feel emotions. To feel emotions. Now, humans, they understand what you feel because they have the same emotions. Intelligence, they will have very high intelligence but they are unlikely to have consciousness. What we see in computers is a very fast, really amazing development of intelligence, but so far we see zero development of consciousness. Computers don't feel anything. Even when it comes to emotional intelligence, the ability to recognize emotions and respond to them, computers don't do it by having emotions of themselves. They just analyze the biological pattern fear when you are frightened there are very clear patterns in your body maybe you feel trembling maybe your heart rate goes up maybe your blood pressure goes up this is how AI will know what I feel that I, I'm frightened it will not feel fear itself actually in some situation could be a good thing because you know with a human doctor I become angry at the doctor very often, the doctor becomes angry also and starts shouting at me. AI will never be angry. If I shout at an AI doctor, the doctor just knows, oh, this human is now angry. And based on my statistical database, I know that the best thing to do when this kind of person is very angry is to say this or to say that. And the AI will react in the most appropriate way. Do you think it will likely happen in the future that AIs might have a decision-making or free mind, a decision-making power, which would enable them to make decisions against human beings' wills? In other words, I mean, how, I mean there, there could be a scenario of the black box. We don't know the logic of these AIs and what they do, how, why the logic is like that, but it just happens as it happens. Mm -hmm. Do you think that will happen to free mind against human beings mind which we don't understand. I don't think there is any indication that AI is uh, in the process of developing consciousness or developing free will, but I do think that very soon AI will be so complex that we won't understand how it reaches decisions and our ability to predict or to instruct the decisions of the AI will decrease more and more decisions will be taken by AI 
without humans being able to understand why the AI decided like this and not like that. For example, more and more banks and corporations are even now giving AI uh, authority to make decisions about, for example, whether to give you a loan or whether to hire you to a new job. And they increasingly rely on the AI without understanding how the AI reaches a decision. I apply for the bank to get a loan, and the bank says, no, we don't give you a loan. And you ask the bank, why not? And the bank says, the algorithm said no. The AI said not to give you a loan. And you ask, why not? What's wrong with me? And the bank says, we don't know. We just trust the AI. This is why we have the AI, because it can recognize patterns in the data, and it can reach conclusions that no human being can. And we trust the AI, and we don't know why the AI refused to give you a loan. In the past, humans often discriminated against entire categories of people. Like, we don't want to hire you to the job because you're a woman, or because you're black, or because you're gay. So you discriminate against an entire group. AI, you can program it not to discriminate against women or against gays, but then the AI may start making new kinds of discrimination, individual discrimination, that the AI doesn't like you because something, and you don't even know why, what's wrong with me? And you can't even, you know, group yourself with other people to protest against the discrimination because you don't know why the AI refuses to give you a job. And uh, even if you knew, it will be something individual about yourself. I mean, the whole power of AI is not to think in terms of large groups, but to go over immense amounts of data about me. And then even if I know why the AI doesn't like me, it's just me. There is no other, no other people that I can organize with and protest against this discrimination. I think technology is never deterministic. The same technology can be used to build very different kinds of societies. So AI may be something very scary and problematic for human beings. Maybe it results in many humans losing their job, losing their economic power, losing their political power. People, all the power concentrated in the hands of a very small elite. And most people having no power and even no understanding what's happening in the world and why am I treated the way I'm treated. So this is one scenario which is very negative. And then, of course, you have positive scenarios that AI releases humans from many of the more boring and, and difficult jobs, um, like you know, to drive a truck all day or to work in a textile factory all day. Uh, it's not a very nice job necessarily. And it could be good that AI takes it. And uh, if the profits, if the uh, wealth is distributed between all people or most people more equally, then this can free the time of people to engage in activities which are much more meaningful for them. It could be with their family, it could be with the uh, art or religion or meditation. AI could empower people instead of taking the power away. Uh, again, the question is who controls the AI and who controls the data? And this is not deterministic. We, can, we now have a kind of choice before us. I mean, AI is going to change the world, but whether for good or for bad, it still depends on our decisions. Are you more worried about the uh, AI technology being manipulated and abused by a, a bunch of people or certain evil-minded people in the future and do harmful things to human beings? Mm -hmm. The real danger is that it's not going to be computers against humans. It's going to be some humans empowered by the new technology against the rest of humanity. If we are not careful, the immense powers of AI may come to serve a small number of countries or even uh, uh, some classes within a country, while most people will lose their economic and political power and then we'll see a much more unequal human society. 
than in any previous time in history. It's a bit like what happened in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, that the invention of steam engines and trains and electricity empowered the upper classes in a few countries like Britain and France and Germany. And for many years, these few industrial powers conquered and exploited very brutally most of humankind. If we are not careful, the same thing may happen again in the 21st century with AI, perhaps with different countries, but the danger is, is there. This seems now so far so good, all these AI machines, they're, well, at least for a, for a wage your goal match. Alpha Go always made the right decision. Yeah. And, and Deep Blue, they always made the right decision. But what is right? Yeah, what, I what is right? What happens if you're put into a situation where you're in a dilemma? So what, what is right? Like. Who is, the, is anyone monitoring it? It's, that's a very good yeah. point. Remember there was a one film about two boats and people were hijacked by all these villains and on each boat there was one button. And oh, then I remember you have that to movie. Press the button. Then the other boat would explode. It was a boat full of prisoners, save your, your right? your own boat. Yeah, I remember it was a, a boat full of prisoners yes. and a, another boat. That's civilians, right. Civilians. And so someone had to decide which one to blow up. Exactly. Right? Well, you, you have to press the button to blow the other boat to save your boat. Yeah. If you put it in a scenario facing the AI, I guess the AI, if they make the right decision is to save themselves, then probably they'll press the button. Yeah. But in the movie, in the end, it's happy ending. Yeah. No one pressed the button. Mm -hmm. What people argued, people fight it, but no one pressed the button. That's the best scenario. That's the best decision. But if the AI is very logical, mm. which button will it press? Right? We never know. Yeah. We never know. We, we did mention that AI, they don't really have consciousness. But you know, when they're confronted with this kind of ethical moments, ethical decisions, mm. ethical scenarios, what do they do? Yeah. Press the button and take a look. Well, sometimes AI will be better, even in ethical decisions, and sometimes worse. So I'll, I'll give examples. In the case of a self-driving car, that needs to decide like whether to kill one person or 10 persons. The problem is that even if we discuss, like we take the best philosophers in the world, we take Confucius and we take Buddha and we take Karl Marx and put them together in a room to discuss a difficult ethical problem. And they come up with a solution that if you are about to kill say 10 people and you can save them, if the car moves to the side and kills the owner of the car, you had better kill yourself. And even if people agree, people will not do it, actually, because in the moment of crisis, your emotions take over, you forget all about the philosophy. So one of the biggest problems in ethics is that very often there is very little connection between the ideals that we think are right of the philosophers and how people actually behave because people are controlled by their emotions and not by their philosophical belief. But w with the AI, you can take that this philosophical decision made by the best philosophers in the world, and you can code this into the algorithm that controls all the car. And it is as if Confucius is driving every car on the road. And whenever there is a dilemma, it's not the AI that makes a new decision. It follows the instructions it got. And in many situations, it will behave in a much more ethical way than the average human being. But of course, the danger is that if you code the AI with uh, an evil decision, then it will still do whatever you instruct it. There are no human emotions, there are no human views that will change the behavior. So if, say, a government gives the, the algorithms a very bad instructions, ethical instructions, it will still do so. 
and the AI will never revolt and never refuse to obey any orders. There's always this pros and cons, and then what do we do? I mean, can we do anything to make sure AIs only do good things for human beings? Yeah, how do we regulate it? I mean, who should be involved? The government, the people? Government, must be the government. Private corporations, <laughs> us, do we, get a, do we have a say in it? I guess everyone has a say or has a role to play, you never know. Mm. I mean, it's like, I don't know, I mean, like the gene technology, the government, they've, the governments of many countries, they've introduced some rules and laws and regulations to try to regulate the research on gene because yeah. it involves the, once again, the ethical side of it. Dilemma, right? exactly. But at the same time, people also expect the future development of the technology mm to save more human beings, yeah. to make our lives better. I guess the same thing also applies in the area of AI research. You just have to find a right balance. Mm. Mm. But the thing is, I mean, the dilemma could be who decides what is good, what is not yeah. for human beings? The government? Researchers? I mean, the dilemma itself is a dilemma. Yeah. I think it should be a joint decision. With everyone should be able to participate. So we have a, we need to have a United Nations <laughs> <laughs> on the AI. On the AI, exactly. We, we, that's, we should that's have a world conference opinion. at least every year. Yeah. Well, somehow there is something similar that is happening. There was one conference held in LA, not at, in, in LA or in, in California. Somehow all these insiders, industry insiders, they meet and then uh, they, they're gathered to actually to introduce all these new rules and people they expect all these researchers should follow to make sure that AIs only do, again, good, good things, things but what is good? Well, mm. let's hear what they have to say about this. So who should be doing that job? The government introducing new laws, banning scientists doing research on certain aspects or maybe following, say, the Arceloma principles, you know, just mm -hmm. making all these guidelines for all these industry insiders to make sure that we only in the future make beneficial AIs instead of, say, evil AIs in the mm -hmm. future. At this stage, what we can say that um, we need three things to, to begin with uh, to prevent the dangerous possibilities from, from being realized. First of all, we need a political debate about these issues. Secondly, uh, we need debate about the control of data to regulate the ownership of data. And thirdly, we need uh, action on a global level. We need global cooperation. So first, we need to start having a serious political debate about these issues, because maybe this is the most important political question of our time. And it's not a good idea to leave it to the free market and to private corporations. Currently, what is happening that um, many governments around the world are simply oblivious to uh, the, the fast rise of artificial intelligence. And much of the most important decisions, many of the most important decisions, are taken just by private corporations that don't represent anybody. And I, I'm not against, of course, private corporations moving forward and, and thinking about these issues. Um, I'm just think, I just think that we can't leave it just to them. The public and the governments need to be involved. The second point is about the ownership of data. You know, what we need to realize is that the most important asset in the 21st century is going to be data, and especially personal data, my data. If in the past, the most important asset was land, and you had conflict about who owns the land, and then it was factories and machinery, and you had conflicts, who will own the factories and the machinery? In the 21st century, the key question is who owns the data? especially my own data, like my biometric data, my DNA, my medical record, uh, the record of everything I do every day. At present, this data is being accumulated by a, a few organizations, some of them 
governmental organizations, some of them are private corporations, and this data will be the key to control the world. Whoever have enough data and enough computing power will be able to decipher and predict uh, human behavior. We, we are far from realizing this situation, and we need here a completely new thinking about ownership and to give people some ownership over their own data. And the third point is that we need global cooperation on this because AI, the rise of AI, is a global revolution. And if just one country takes action about the potential dangers, it will not prevent the continuation of the dangerous development in other countries. For example, if you're afraid of giving AI control of weapons and AI being able to fire and to kill people uh, without any authorization from, from humans. So let's say China uh, forbids the development of autonomous weapon systems, but the United States or Russia continue to do it. So you won't solve the problem and very soon China itself will feel pressure to compete with Russia and the US in this field. So if you are afraid of a particular development like uh, autonomous weapons, the only serious way to stop it is through global cooperation. And national policy alone will not solve the problem. So after listening to the end of the, to what they had to say, what's your impression? I personally feel like there should be different rules for different kind of AIs because you can't just have one rule to apply for everything. That's true. For though. different fields, right? Because yeah, you AI. have AI in the medical care, you have AI in yeah. different different um, industries. For education. For education. For, 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 for social video media. Games, yeah. for, for competing in a Go match or things and, like and cause that. And because you will also be collecting all this data. If it's for medical purpose, I feel like you should have more say. I yeah. mean, if it's for personal use, I really think it depends. So I think there should be different kind of regulations for different fields. So one thing's for sure, we should introduce the rules and regulations yeah. to, to try to make sure that they only do good things. I right? think so, yeah. But at the same time, I guess we also, we also need to wait and see because we need to enhance our own knowledge about AIs, what AI can do, what AI cannot do, whether I guess in the near future we are able to understand whether they are going to develop consciousness or not, or whether they are going to be emotional or not, what kind of threat they are going to pose to the job market in the future. I mean, until we can understand better of the AI technology that we, we can't really do much about, say, preparing you know, the, the future generations for their future with AIs, whether AI is going to dominate us or we are going to control AIs. Mm -hmm. So we need to be cautious. And I guess the government, I'm sure the government has a very important yeah. role to play in it. I guess, you know, we just have to be prepared for what's coming. Yeah. Yeah. If there is only one concern, though. Yeah. We're going to lose our, our job. I hope, uh, I mean... You might be talking to an AI, <laughs> a machine an in AI the future. AI, right? Or maybe two machines will be talking, talking to, to each, each other. other. You'd never know but which one is which. But there's something that they can't share, it's sense of humor. Do you think they'll have a sense of humor? Mm. Work on your jokes. Yeah. I think that's something that, that sure, will secure our job. You sure you're not, you're not talking to a machine now? <laughs> I've been a I machine for all the time. <laughs> I just might be. <laughs> okay, once again, thank you for your time and for watching this episode. We'll see you again next time. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Join us in next week's crossover for a discussion on how artificial intelligence is posed to be a game changer for the healthcare industry. Will it open up unimaginable potentials for doctors and patients? Will it redesign medical diagnosis and treatment plans? Or will it be a risk to patient privacy? Stay tuned!